Italy. Enchanting and beautiful home to historic architecture, art and fashion. But there's a dark heart to this tourist dream. Italy is also a society of organized crime, corruption and unsolved murders. Out of this chilling reality, a new wave of crime fiction has emerged. With its own twist on the conventions of the detective novel. Unlike the Scandinavians who follow what I would term the British and American tradition fairly closely, i.e. murder, puzzle, psychology, the Italians, their books are much more relevant to the, the, the world we live in. It's a no-nonsense, no-frills, crime thriller, which is absolutely in your face. It's a world where everyone is a suspect. In a society where no one can be trusted, Italian crime writers take an almost philosophical delight in telling stories that offer no simple resolutions. We write more noir in Italy than traditional thriller. That's because we are more pessimistic than you about human nature. A noir world with no happy endings. è che sono pochi i casi che vengono che vengono risolti The detective novels of Andrea Camilleri are set in contemporary Sicily. They deal with the casebook of the worldly Inspector Montalbano of the local police force. I absolutely adore Inspector Montalbano. I think the uh, the, the character is uh, um, is in many ways, you know, very you know a kind of stereotypical sort of view of of an Italian, and perhaps you know also of course of a, of a Sicilian of Sicily. And this is particularly sort of I think shown through his love of food. Montalbano is as enthusiastic when forensically inspecting a menu as he is searching for clues to a crime. Bring me a generous serving of the hake. Ah, and while I'm waiting, make me a nice plate of seafood antipasta. È proprio volontario, proprio come sottolineato il fatto che ami mangiare, ami partecipare, ami vivere. C'è un detto molto bello che Primum vivere de inde filosofari, eh, prima vivere e poi si fa filosofia. Eh, per Montalbano potrebbe essere primum vivere de inde indagari, <ride> però eh, questo è un, un po' un suo fatto istintivo di amare la vita perché si nasce. Camilleri armed Montalbano with a dry sense of humour. My dear friends, said the lawyer upon entering the room, please, don't get out. Can I get you anything? I have whatever you want. No, thank you, said Minutolo. Yes, please. I'd like a daiquiri, said Montalbano. The lawyer gave him a befuddled look. Like all Sicilian policemen, Montalbano has to face the Mafia. But Camilleri handles this confrontation in a surprising way. La gran parte dei romanzi di Montalbano 
qualche pagina dedicata all'incontro con un mafioso, c'è quasi sempre, ma è marginale. Direi che questa marginalità è voluta da parte mia, non per sminuire il problema, non parlarne sarebbe stata un'ipocrisia, il problema esiste come. The mafia uh, is so deeply implicated into the uh, structure of uh, Sicilian and Italian society that if it disappeared a lot of it would actually crumble. I mean it's the cement that glues some of the bricks together uh, and until they can find a substitute they have to be there. In a community where no one can be relied on, Camilleri's stories are a web of intrigue where nothing is ever as it seems. The television series portrays Montalbano's encounters with the Mafia in a very particular way. Vengono in qualche modo nobilitati dalla scrittura. Metta conto, prendo tanto per fare un esempio, il padrino, l'interpretazione incredibile di bravura di Marlon Brando ci fa dimenticare che quello è un mandante di omicidi a ogni piesso spinto. Questo è il rischio che si corre, in qualche modo di nobilitare la mafia e io mi rifiuto di farlo. Instead, Camilleri chooses to focus on Montalbano's commitment to the law. He is someone that really has a really very strong sense of justice uh, and he will pursue something because, you know, he wants to get to the truth. Mia cognata è stata avvelenata. Montalbano's image may be laid back, but his methods are not. Here he conducts a classic interview. Different from most other Italian coppers is that he isn't judgmental. He takes on the chin whatever he hears. He might be judgmental in terms of his own feelings that he doesn't necessarily to show to people, but he remains this cool, rational presence, a bit Holmesian, if you like, where kind of the intellect takes over, although he's a very physical man, he's concerned with food, he's concerned with sex, those are elements of his life. But he's still just basically a rational intelligence that works on problems. And um, it's, it's conveyed by Camilleri that people talk to him and they trust him. He gets results that way, more that way than by browbeating people. But faced with a corrupt society, Montalbano is rarely able actually to solve a crime. And this sets him apart from the traditional fictional detective. Però la verità è che sono pochi casi che vengono che vengono risolti con la sicurezza assoluta. E in Italia poi non c'è neanche più la certezza della pena. Allora a questo punto il povero giallista comincia per forza di cosa a porsi delle domande. Dice, davvero io devo essere colui che ricuce il telo strappato della società? Perché lo devo fare? Perché devo avere questo compito? Ma è giusto che io questo lo dichiari colpevole in modo assoluto, lasciamogli qualche possibilità alternativa. Ecco, è difficile raggiungere la verità assoluta. La verità assoluta uno può anche discutere che esista. The lack of a resolution in the Inspector Montalbano stories can trace its roots back to a novel set in Rome in 1927 during Mussolini's fascist regime. In That Awful Mess on the Via Marulana, Carlo Emilio Gada employed a crime story to explore Italy's fascist era. He's using the tropes of crime fiction, the burglary, the murder, and the ensuing investigation, more 
as a way of examining society and uh, what has caused the state of affairs, the fascist state in Italian society. That awful mess on the Via Merulana begins with the murder of a woman in an upmarket Rome apartment. The body of the poor signora was lying in an infamous position. A deep, terrible red cut opened her throat fiercely. It had taken half the neck from the front towards the right, that is, towards her left, the right to those who were looking down. But Gada shows how pointless it is to investigate a single crime when the society that surrounds it is so corrupt. Gada's story subtly reveals the way fascism penetrated the lives of ordinary Italians. It is an extremely critical view of, uh, of the regime, particularly because one of the, the things that to me is very interesting in the novel is the way in which the main character, the main female character, um, it, it really represents what uh, Italian women were um, facing during the fascist years. So it's, a, it's a clearly a very patriarchal society. Um, you know, Liliana can't have children, uh, so she has all these um, fairly ambiguous, complex relationships with other young women you know, that are adopted by her. And the whole crime revolves around that. You know, she's been murdered, and you know, we need to find out who murdered her. Gada was an established literary figure who delivered his anti-fascist message in a distinctive style that mixed local dialects and slang to satirize Italy's dictator. Gada, when he talks about Mussolini, he is satirical of his sort of performances, his penchant for particular uniforms, his macho posturing. There's a series of name calling that goes on. Here, Gada mocks Mussolini in a way Italian readers would have instantly recognized. The hereditary syphilitic. The illiterate day laborer's jaw. I think he was attempting to do something which really hadn't been done before, and obviously the closest parallel is Joyce. The time we spend in Rome is like the time we spend in Dublin with Joyce. It's astonishingly varied panoply, this, this picture of an entire society. It uses, like Joyce, a variety of different styles. So it uses a, a straightforward academic style, it uses popular vernacular, it just throws everything in. In front of the big louse-coloured building, a crowd circumfused by a protected and odd job man, also in an apron striped, his nose the shape and colour of a concierges. wondrous pet, the maids, the little daughters of the concierges. What you have is a kind of a detective story, but it's a kind of almost a sort of uh, a, a playing with the conventions of the detective story. You have a particular kind of inspector, you have a particular kind of investigation, um, one that's ultimately open-ended and unresolved. And it seems to be that this is an inquiry into the nature of reality and the nature of the way in which one can know reality. So every type of inquiry leads to a new set of interpretative po possibilities. So you can never really get to know and understand uh, reality fully. The kind of the suggestion is that what fascism is really doing is imposing a series of infantile simplifications on the complexity of reality. By setting his detective novel in the fascist era, Gada became the first writer to use the crime story as a way of looking at Italian history. I've always thought that Gada actually is one of the very first writers that uh, makes the link between crime fiction and uh, Italian um, history very clear, and that will become almost like a blueprint for later writers. Mm. 
After Mussolini's fascist dictatorship ended with Italy's defeat in the Second World War, a writer from Sicily began gathering material for crime stories which would challenge another sinister force that came to dominate post-war Italy. Into the 1960s, Leonardo Sciascia's novels would expose the power of the Sicilian Mafia. The Mafia had emerged as powerful players in Italian society during the US occupation in the immediate post-war years. Leonardo Sciascia's 1961 novel, The Day of the Owl, told the story of a police detective's battle to solve the murder of a local businessman. At every turn, his investigations are hampered by murky mafia forces. It's a novel in which you really get a sense of how deeply embedded uh, the Mafia is in Sicilian society, not just simply from the point of view of uh, the economics, but also from the point of view of the culture and how the reign of terror that, uh, in a sense, you know, uh, grips Sicily has influenced the way in which Sicilians um, live their life, the social cohesion of communities. The whole idea of, uh, of not being able to speak freely, the sense of distrust that people have. On a personal level, the difficult relationship that people have with each other, all based on the fact that you cannot trust anybody. Two ear-splitting shots rang out. The beginning of the novel in which you know someone gets shot by the mafia and, uh, and no one has seen or heard anything is is really emblematic of that nobody on the bus saw a thing it was a hell of a job to find out who was on the bus passengers said the windows were so steamy they looked like frosted glass maybe true no one has seen anything, you don't want to be involved because it's far too dangerous to be involved. You, you do know in Sicily, or you knew at the time, that you didn't have, um, you know, the police wouldn't come to help. The state was not there for you. Uh, and, uh, and that, I think, instigates a mechanism of self-preservation. So you, you pretend that nothing has happened. Uh, you don't want to know, you haven't seen, you haven't heard, you mind your own business, you, know, you, uh, you lead your life in a very um, kind of closed world. Shasha doesn't consider himself to be a crime writer. He's looking at society, and particularly Shasha, as opposed to maybe Gardo or others, uh, what's important for him is not just obviously the Sicily, but it's also the landscape, the colors, the smells of Sicily, which I think come through incredibly well in his writing. Dawn was infusing the countryside. It seemed to rise from the tender green wheat from the rocks and dripping trees and mount imperceptibly towards a blank sky. The gramoli, incongruous in green uplands, looked like a huge black hole sponge, soaking up the light, flooding the landscape. Sicily is different. I mean, you uh, you get off a boat in the plane and you feel you are in a different country. In some cases, it's a bit like if you understand French, you go to Quebec. You almost don't understand the language, uh, and the Sicilians are very proud to be uh, to have seceded, so, so to speak, from Italy. Uh, not only geographically, but also I think mentally. But it's a different atmosphere altogether, and there's a certain pride of place. Like Gada. Shasha chose to reject the conventional model of detective fiction. Instead, his investigator, Inspector Bellodi, is forced to confront the corruption that exists in the society around him. In Day of the Owl, the interesting thing is the protagonist who goes on a journey of discovery. It's an education for him. 
he has to learn the way thing, he, he learns the real politic of, of the way things get done and the way things don't get done. And that book, more than many Italian crime books, has it all encapsulated the fact that you learn who committed the crime, but there isn't necessarily closure. And we really want that, readers want that. But the great Italian crime writers don't, don't give you that. They say, okay, you know who committed the crime, uh, but this is the real world and criminals go unpunished. By the late 1960s, Shasha began to inject political intrigue into his stories as a way of talking about the rise of terrorism in Italy, an era that would become known as the Years of Lead. The Years of Lead starts uh, from December 1969 when a bomb is planted in, uh, in a bank in the centre of Milan in Piazza Fontana. There's a real sense at the time of, uh, of great discontent. This neo-fascist bombing began a decade of terror, with bloody attacks launched by both right and left-wing extremists. Shasha now took on Italian politics. In 1971, he wrote Equal Danger, a tense crime thriller about the murder, one by one, of some of the country's top judges. Never had prosecutors or judges been threatened or struck down for a position taken during a trial, or for a verdict delivered. In equal danger, there is a plot to blame the murders on left-wing extremists. Shasha takes on both the left and the right, so he's instructed to pin the crime on the left. But it's not that simple. But you would think, oh yes, okay, that means he's a writer of the left, therefore the left will be idealized. No, they're not. They're shown as disinterested. They have fashionable left-wing causes which they take up. And it's quite a nuanced view of, of Italian society. Maybe typical in many ways of a lot of Italians who, who do have ambiguous views about political dimensions. Mr. Armar was a political man. And a political man is usually killed for political reasons. We have a period of great sort of social unrest, uh, political uncertainty, um, um, a sense in which uh, no one knew whether the enemy came from within the state uh, or from outside. Through the 1970s, Italy was torn apart by a series of violent terrorist attacks. In total in that period, we have 14,000 terrorist attacks, 374 people are killed, and 1,170 are wounded. In 1978, the kidnapping and murder of former Prime Minister Aldo Moro troubled Italians. Was Moro killed by the Marxist militant group, the Red Brigades, or by sinister forces connected to the government? The conspiracy theories surrounding the execution of Moro prompted Leonardo Sciascia to write his own investigation. In The Moro Affair, Shasha drew his readers' attention to inconsistencies in the official version of events. It all contributed to an atmosphere of political turmoil in which there were frequent miscarriages of justice. The victim of one famous case would write crime stories which drew on his experience of the years of lead. ed è di una violenza assoluta. In 1976, Massimo Carlotto was a student and left-wing activist who was framed for a murder he didn't commit. Allora, io sono stato testimone in diretta di un delitto, nel senso che ho ritrovato una persona gravemente ferita 
e dopo che mi sono presentato ai carabinieri per testimoniare e dato che ero un militante politico della sinistra rivoluzionaria sono stato immediatamente arrestato su un pregiudizio in base a un pregiudizio e immediatamente sono diventato il colpevole. After being sentenced to 15 years in prison, Carlotto fled Italy, first to Paris and then to Central America. He was returned to an Italian prison after five years on the run and began an extraordinary legal battle to clear his name. E sono stato il cittadino italiano più processato in assoluto per un unico reato e questo ha fatto di me il, un famoso caso, il caso Carlotto. Quindi è una dimensione di stress psicologico fortissimo, quasi insopportabile, anche perché nel periodo del, del processo io ho deciso anche per un certo numero di anni di sottrarmi a questa follia. Eh, fuggendo all'estero, sono diventato il fuggiasco che poi ho raccontato. Eventually pardoned, Carlotto was released in 1993. This experience led him to write The Fugitive, which became a best-selling novel. I was a classic accidental fugitive. Someone who never expected to have problems with the law, who never thought he would need to invent an escape from his own country as the one way to save his own life, his freedom and his dignity. The Fugitive inspired a film about Carlotto's years on the run. No me completo, hijo de puta. This graphic scene leaves the audience in no doubt about how tough it was for him. He was tortured at the hands of the Mexican police after he was captured. Villani. Allora, cabrón, hijo de puta, eh. Il tuo nome completo è Massimo Carlotto Villani. Ma eh, l'esperienza messicana è stata breve ma molto intensa dal punto di vista della conoscenza della violenza dei sistemi repressivi sia giudiziario che penitenziario messicano. Carlotto è un caso molto speciale perché ovviamente è un uomo che sa da prima parte di misericordia di giustizia. È incredibile, davvero, se pensate a questo. What, what he went through in terms of the accusations and the time he spent on the run and so forth before he became a writer. The ending of that in Britain might have been a ghostwriter coming in, so the celeb writes a disposable book that's thrown away that tells a story, everybody reads it and it's serialized in the papers. He actually turned into a very good writer. Carlotto has gone on to write violent crime fiction set in contemporary Italy drawn from his experience of being in the country's toughest prisons. E lì è stata un'esperienza più lunga che devo dire che però alla fine per il mio lavoro è stata utilissima perché ho conosciuto un sacco di brutta gente che con cui oggi continuo a mantenere rapporti che mi danno un sacco di informazioni utili per per i miei romanzi. Carlotto's rough justice shaped the raw writing style of his novels. He was influenced by the political tone of Leonardo Sciascia, but he added a new level of brutality all his own to stories like The Goodbye Kiss. It's a no-nonsense, no-frills crime thriller which is absolutely in your face and it doesn't deal with, with subtleties. But Italian readers and British readers who have encountered him know exactly where they are with him. The books are kind of like a bucket of cold water being thrown in the face. His books basically look at, obviously, uh, white slavery, prostitution, drugs. I mean, there's nothing easy or cosy about his books. For the goodbye kiss, Carlotto rejected the convention of an investigating detective. He inverted this tradition by creating an amoral, violent former terrorist as the lead character. Mm. 
The darkly shot opening scene from the film of The Goodbye Kiss sets up this figure perfectly as he coldly shoots one of his own men in the back of the head. Questo è stato il primo personaggio, Giorgio Pellegrini, il personaggio di Arrivederci Amore e Ciao, è stato il primo eh, personaggio della letteratura poliziesca italiana a essere non solo un antieroe, ma un antieroe assolutamente spietato, ma estremamente aderente alla realtà. The Goodbye Kiss is filmed as a modern day noir. In this world, killings are at once realistic and stylized. The male characters are real, sort of, you know, macho, um, you know, strong, aggressive. Um, and this is not simply because, you know, Carlotto is using a particular genre in which, you know, traditionally, you know, male characters are, um, are depicted in a certain way. There's, there's something more to that. Um, when you look at the, the way in which women are represented in the novels, uh, they're very marginal. Carlotto's time spent with hardened criminals shaped the hardcore misogynistic actions of his lead characters. I don't think Carlotto does uh, understand women. He sees them basically as pawns in terrible games, uh, which is probably why there is so much violence against women and uh, these women seldom fight back. I think he's the kind of writer who says, I'm sorry, this is it. I'm not going to varnish things. This is the way people behave. Di questo tipo di romanzo perché ci permette di raccontare e criticare la realtà. There's no sentimentality. There's kind of a small amount of human feeling. In fact, when you read a Colletto book, you're, you're trying to search out that bit of human feeling because you want it and you grab it and you're really grateful for it. He's not dealing with that. Carlotto's version of realism is motivated by a desire to bring what he regards as a more journalistic approach than seen in Anglo-American crime fiction. La differenza tra le due letterature è che noi a differenza degli scrittori anglo-americani abbiamo una necessità di coprire un enorme buco che è quello dell'assenza dell giornalismo d'inchiesta. Qui in Italia nessuno fa più giornalismo d'inchiesta rispetto al, alle trasformazioni criminali, non si racconta più la grande criminalità, soprattutto quella organizzata. Questa è la grande differenza. I romanzieri anglo-americani sono rimasti romanzieri. Noi abbiamo avuto la necessità di diventare qualcosa di più. Carlotto's first-hand experience of Italy's violent underworld has heralded a new wave of Italian writers who base their novels on real characters. Giancarlo De Cataldo's debut novel, Romanzo Criminale, was inspired by his work as an investigating judge, a role that took him to both crime scenes and prisons. Being a judge helps me to go in some places where writers long for going all their lives, like houses where people have been killed, and so that's a chance. If you are talented as a writer, if you have this gift, you must use it. It would be a crime not to use it. Cataldo's uh, training as a judge and his activity as a judge I think is important not only because it gives him a visibility, it gave visibility to his books at the beginning, it, it attracted additional interest because, but also because it informs his, his way of writing. De Cataldo based his story on a real criminal street gang, the Banda della Maliana. 
I studied the phenomenon of Banda de la Maliana, which was a, a gang organization from people coming from the suburbs of Rome that became a real criminal power um, collecting money and imposing a kind of law as if mafia for the first time had taken place in Rome. I first met one of those people from the gang, he was a repented, uh, was under protection of justice, but the, those judges didn't believe him, so he was set free and then murdered. The second occasion was, the second chance was uh, working in a trial against some of the members of this gang, the survivors, because many of them have dead. They were uh, real criminals, but they were uh, old-style criminals at, at the same time. Set over more than a decade, Di Cataldo's novel imagines how these gangsters may have been involved in the darkest chapters of the years of lead, an era that continues to intrigue Italians. One of the achievements of Romanzo Criminale is to fold in the real-life events that he talks about in a kind of responsible way. I mean, it's a long tradition, you know, Tolstoy put Napoleon in War and Peace, so it's been happening for quite a long time to put real events in. In 2005, these real events were brought to the cinema screen, when Romanzo Criminale was adapted into a stylish gangster epic, dubbed The Italian Goodfellas. A pivotal scene from the film deliberately mixes real-life news reports of the kidnapping of former Prime Minister Aldo Moro with the action, reflecting the twin focus of the book. I think the novel wants to inform readers. I think the novel wants to convey historical facts and certainly wants to convey a particular idea of historical facts as well. De Cataldo also explores the bloodiest event from the years of lead, which took place at Bologna train station in August 1980. In a dramatic scene from the film, gang member Ice finds himself in the wrong place at the wrong time. A fictional character being placed within this environment allows us to indulge what might have taken place. We see Ice arriving at the station, the clock says 10.23. We know at 10.25 the bomb has to go off. And to see him emerging from the station with the bomb going off behind him, and then walking in the rubble of what is um, an incredibly effective reconstruction of the events is extremely disturbing. And I think that that scene brings us um, into the heart of the Bologna bombing. It puts us there among the dead. I mean, the, the, the shots of children are, are incredibly chilling. And it brings home to us as well that this is not just a fun gangster movie, but that there is a very sinister side to it. The movie is far different from uh, the book, because in the book uh, we have no, li no real link in a, uh, in a com compromission between the gang and the Bologna massacre. Uh, the movie is far different. But what I wanted to mark was that a part of Italian history was criminal history and that there's a grey zone between the normal citizen, the power, the legal economy and the underworld. And that's why Romanzo Criminale is more than a thriller, a historical and political crime novel. The location of this bombing was significant. Bologna, a university city, was known as Red Bologna 
in part due to its reputation as a center of left-wing politics. And today, this politically radical city has inspired a young female author to write a crime story which confronts the rise of sexual violence against women. Perché oggi, nei tempi moderni, una donna arriva a uccidere. In 2010, Barbara Baraldi's novel, The Girl with the Crystal Eyes, introduced a new character into Italian crime fiction. The female vigilante. La bambola dagli occhi di cristallo è nata da una scena che avevo in mente, una donna che uccideva, uh, uccideva, uccideva un uomo ma più di un uomo e quindi un interrogativo molto grande perché oggi nei tempi moderni una donna arriva a uccidere. She removes her magic wand from the top of her hold up stockings and caresses his throat. He hasn't time to scream. The artery in his neck has been sliced open with a small bronze razor that looks like a prop from some old film. The blood sprays everywhere, staining the filthy walls. It covers her, it colors her. In Italia molto spesso soprattutto i crimini sessuali non, non rimangono puniti nel senso che vengono rilasciati subito e, e quindi mh, ho pensato di costruire questo personaggio provocatorio di una mh, giustiziera che gira durante la notte la città di Bologna che un, un tempo era considerata una città tranquilla, gagliardica ma in realtà nasconde il suo lato oscuro. E questa giustiziera appunto si veste in maniera provocante e quando viene aggredita uccide. Quindi uccide soltanto chi i malintenzionati. Sicuramente i fatti di cronaca, come dicevo prima, eh, perché appunto nel momento che è stato scritto c'è stato proprio uno scoppio di di crimini quasi tutti di natura sessuale. Io ricordo il più grave che anche quello è stato un po' preso con leggerezza, una ragazza in pieno giorno alla fermata dell'autobus è stata trascinata nel parchetto lì vicino e violentata, quindi cioè, in pieno giorno una studentessa, cioè, ehm, io avevo molta rabbia mh, di fronte a tutte queste cose. Her quick, small fingers pick up a rose. But it's not the rose's thorns that pierce the man's flesh, but a kitchen knife, sharp and shining, that enters deep into his chest and then slides out again, spurting hot, dark, dense drops of blood that splash the perfect features of her face. She said, I love you, boy, I love you so. She said, I love you, baby, oh. I think you'd have to say that a writer like Baraldi has a cinematic sensibility. She deals in a kind of visual language, even though it's words on a page, which she knows readers will, will quickly relate to. So there is the, the literary equivalent of fast cutting and cutting between scenes. And there's a minimum of, of exposition, there's a minimum of explanation, because she thinks my readership will be able to keep up with me, and if they don't, too bad. They're going to have to struggle initially, but it will be worth it in the end. So she's of a generation where film has informed her writing as much as anything she's read. Baraldi found inspiration for her horror writing style from literary classics familiar to British readers. E ultimamente mi hanno definito la nuova esponente del nuovo gotico italiano. Io mi sono formata proprio con uh, il romanticismo, poi con il, con il mystery, appassionata di Mary Shelley, di queste, di queste atmosfere da, da Dracula. 
She takes a last look in the gilded mirror, a mirror that wouldn't be out of place in a fairy tale, a fairy tale that's frightening, but where she's the fairest of them all, beautiful just as she is, smelling of blood. They're almost like dark, nasty, black fairy tales. And in that respect, she is quite unique. Quando, quando ero bambina, ad esempio, che leggevo le fiabe, la cosa che mi colpiva di più della fiaba era il fatto che ci fossero, eh, che venissero descritte anche fiabe molto cruente, la strega cattiva, oppure mi ricordo la fiaba di Barba Blu in cui c'erano queste mogli appese, c'era la camera dove non potevi entrare, la chiave macchiata di sangue. Barbara Baraldi obviously has to make her mark in a society which maybe doesn't have the most enlightened views of women, so there are various ways to go. She went in the way which is a kind of rebellious, punkish way. She's probably aiming at a younger readership, and you certainly wouldn't read one of her books if you were squeamish or easily shocked, because she put it down very quickly. It's taken a long time for the women to come, come out, and Barbara Raldi is one, but you have other writers. You've got Francesca Mazzucato, you've got absolutely a mad writer called uh, Isabella Santa Croce, who does incredible public events, and whose books are almost like Lewis Carroll goes psycho. The women, rather than bringing a sort of softer, cozy version of it, which for instance, a lot of uh, British and American uh, female writers do. It is a bit cozy, it's a bit too convenient. We're still in the tradition of Miss Marple, uh, although obviously Highsmith, Rendell uh, are very dark from a psychological point of view. But the new Italian uh, women writers uh, bring a feminine touch, but a feminine touch which is actually quite bloody uh, and uh, proves uh, an absolutely fascinating contrast with uh, their male uh, counterparts. A contemporary of Baraldi's is another Bologna writer who has brought a journalistic rigor to the genre to become the most high-profile and successful writer of Italian noir. Anche nostra come di scrittori, io mi trovo a vivere in un paese nel quale non mi fido. Carlo Lucarelli is the celebrity face of Italian crime fiction, even presenting a hugely popular TV show where he casts himself as the lead investigator into real crimes. He has a, a very peculiar interest in setting himself up as an investigative journalist, come historian, come writer. So he wants to combine all three aspects. He applied his extraordinary method when researching the character of a serial killer in his best-selling novel Almost Blue. E allora sono andato da uno psichiatra. Gli ho detto facciamo conto che qui ci sia seduto il mio personaggio, si chiama Alessio Crotti, viene da Cadoneghe in provincia di Padova, che è un posto che non ha niente a che vedere con i serial killer, ma io ci sono andato una volta a presentare un libro e mi sono perso e allora ho voluto punire quel posto dandogli i natali del mio serial killer, sente le campane, uccide le persone. Perché? E abbiamo fatto una vera perizia psichiatrica su un personaggio finto. Lo psichiatra ha cominciato a chiedermi da dove viene, Cadone, che, che posto è, chi sono i suoi genitori. E abbiamo fatto una perizia. Questo ha dato il, la, la realtà e la voce del mio serial killer. Sometimes my shadow is darker than other people's. I've seen it sometimes when I'm walking along the street. It stains the wall alongside me. Sometimes I get scared that someone will notice it, but I can't run away from it because it would follow me. 
It would spread out stickly and black alongside me. That's why I stay close to the wall. We're inside a psychotic mind. That's more important than in the world that we see in some of the other Italian crime writers. That informs everything. So everything is paranoid, everything is strange, schizophrenic and disturbing. It was the first Italian crime fiction book which, in my opinion, actually integrated perfectly uh, the best of uh, English and American uh, hardboiled uh, crime fiction uh, elements uh, and brought them alive within an Italian context. Lucarelli also used intensive research to dig up his country's troubled past for carte blanche a novel set during the final months of Italy's fascist regime. The police must arrest thieves and murderers so that the Italian people know that in fascist Italy, even in difficult times, the law is always the law. Lucarelli was frustrated at Italy's failure to properly investigate the fascist period. È un periodo importantissimo ovviamente per la storia del nostro paese. Lì si trovano le radici di molte delle contraddizioni e dei problemi che abbiamo oggi. Il mancato superamento del fascismo, la, eh, quello che è successo dopo la seconda guerra mondiale, insomma tante cose. È un momento che è importante. To research carte blanche, Lucarelli tracked down a former policeman who had served in the fascist police. E sono andato ad intervistare un poliziotto che è stato nella polizia politica dal 1941 al 1981, 40 anni. Mi ricordo che nella sua storia lui mi ha raccontato come all'inizio era nella polizia politica di Mussolini, nell'Ovra, e arrestava antifascisti e comunisti, naturalmente. What shocked Lucarelli was that after the war, this fascist officer was allowed to continue as a policeman in Italy's post-war democracy. Il che mi stupisce come nella polizia partigiana lei che era un fascista dice sì io ero bravo un bravo poliziotto c'era bisogno di ordine pubblico partigiana si ritrova ad arrestare i fascisti che prima erano i suoi datori di lavoro Lucarelli's interviews with the policeman would form the basis for the character of Commissioner De Luca in Carte Blanche he would go on to feature in a further two novels to form a period crime trilogy perché mi è sembrato che il commissario De Luca, con tutte le sue contraddizioni, di essere da una parte una persona per bene, un poliziotto, un investigatore, l'uomo che nel romanzo giallo ci porterà alla scoperta della verità, quindi il buono della situazione, ma contemporaneamente anche lo strumento di regimi dittatoriali, eccetera, eccetera, fosse un personaggio pieno di contraddizioni, in grado di attraversare la storia italiana e di raccontarci le contraddizioni di ogni momento. È per questo che l'ho tenuto in vita per tre romanzi e adesso ne sto pensando un quarto, spero di andare avanti così. By tackling Italy's painful history and embracing the lack of any certain resolution, Lucarelli can trace his method back to the roots of Italian noir. He identifies in his fellow writers a shared commitment to write more than simple crime stories. Noi apparteniamo ad un tipo di letteratura che invece le cose le racconta più che metterle veramente in scena. I nostri detective sono tutti personaggi che in qualche maniera vedono quello che succede nella società, ci stanno male capiscono che non possono farci niente, questo è un... uno stato di grande sofferenza. This is the authentic voice of Italian noir.
Inspector Montalbano is here on BBC4 next Saturday with a delicate matter to investigate. That's at nine o'clock. And deadly drama Killing Eve 2 blew us away tonight. No need to wait for the rest. The box set of the whole series is on iPlayer now.